Today, we tell the story of Canada's most prolific serial killer. And with it, highlight failures of the policing and justice systems to protect Indigenous women. Robert Picton's been back in the news this month because the RCMP, who investigated his crimes, want to dispose of the bulk of the evidence that they collected in the case. And recently as well, when the BC coroner issued a public apology to the families for the ways they dealt with some of the remains. The victims' families are strongly opposed to the destruction, and you will soon see why. Though he is Canada's most prolific serial killer, he is probably likely one of the worst serial killers in history, as far as you can make comparisons in these things. Today we look at what he did, unsolved cases that may be tied to him, what has happened to him, what he was convicted of, and the cases that were never prosecuted. Leonard Picton and his wife Louise owned a pig farm out in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, which is just east of the city of Vancouver. They had two sons, Robert and David, and a daughter. The daughter was sent off to live with relatives in Vancouver. The two sons were meant to work on the ramshackle farm. Both boys were sent to school dirty and smelling of manure. They were neglected and abused. In 1963, Picton dropped out of school to work as a butcher's apprentice. He would work as an apprentice for about seven years before returning full-time to the farm. Eventually, Picton and his siblings would inherit that farm and sell off large parts of it for about $5.2 million Canadian. What remained was a falling apart, dilapidated farm that was patrolled by a 600 pound boar. It was a dirty, unkempt farm where pigs were kept in squalor. Picton himself would be described as quiet and strange, occasionally concerning his neighbors with his bizarre behavior. He and his brother neglected the farm, coming into conflict with zoning officials. They altered one of the farm's buildings and held dances there under their registered nonprofit, the Piggy Palace Good Time Society. They held large parties in the building, which was a converted slaughterhouse, until eventually an injunction was issued against them in 2000 and their nonprofit was disbanded. While all this was going on, Picton would be charged with the attempted murder of a sex worker, Wendy Lynn Eistetter. That was in March 1997. Picton handcuffed the woman and stabbed her several times. She survived by disarming him, stabbing him, and fleeing. He escaped naked with a set of handcuffs dangling from her wrist. Police found the key to the handcuffs on Picton, who sought treatment for his injuries. Nonetheless, Crown prosecutors stayed the charges against Picton in January 1998 because they believed Wendy Lynn's drug addiction issues made her testimony unreliable. Picton had been out on a mere $2,000 bail, and by the time of this attack, he had already likely killed at least five women at that farm. Miss Eistetter was meant to be victim number six. Had they tested his clothing? which they seized from him that night. Right away, instead of seven years later, they would have found the DNA of two women who disappeared in 1997. In 2002, the RCMP were involved in the BC Missing Women's Investigation. This investigation was meant to look into the large number of women who disappeared in the province. In February of that year, They had a complaint of illegal firearms at the Picton property. They executed a search warrant on the farm. What they found there was disturbing and led them to get a second search warrant. Personal items belonging to several missing women were found out there on that beaten down farm. Police would... Members of the task force would come out to search 
and the brothers were charged with firearms offenses, but they were released. And from that time, Robert Picton was kept under surveillance. Two weeks after the search, Picton was picked up, arrested, and charged with the first two of a series of murders, those of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. Between February 22, 2002 and May 26, 2005, a total of 27 charges would be laid for Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock, Heather Bottomley, Andrea Josbury, Brenda Wolf, Georgina Pappen, Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmark, Jennifer Firminger, Heather Chinook, Tanya Holick, Sherry Irving, Inga Hall, Kara Ellis, Andrea Borhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marnie Fry, Tiffany Drew, Harry Kosky, Sarah DeVries, Angela Jardine, Wendy Crawford, Diana Melnick, and a Jane Doe. Excavations continued from early 2002 through November 2003. All of the buildings but one have now been demolished, and the Crown has confiscated the land. Forensic analysis of the findings from the excavations proved challenging for a number of reasons, the least of which was that many of the victims were fed to Picton's pigs. Others were left to decompose, and insect infestation consumed a large amount of evidence. Gruesomely, the government would have to warn the public that Picton may have ground up some of the remains and mixed it in with pork that he sold to the public. It is suspected that he sent some remains to a meat processing plant for rendering. He would admit to a planted cellmate that he murdered 49 people, wanted to make it an even 50, and that he was only caught because he had become sloppy. Well, no. He would have been caught much sooner had there not been grave mistakes in the investigations of missing women prior to his arrest. Only 29 of at least 65 missing women from Vancouver's Lower East Side have been linked to Picton. During the time that Picton was picking up and killing women, Vancouver police would refuse to acknowledge a serial killer was at work. Sex workers and other vulnerable women took it upon themselves to work together to protect one another and, frankly, to gather evidence. Despite their efforts and likely as a result of the lack of investigation by police, women continued to disappear. A great many of these women were Indigenous, adding to the lack of empathy and the serious investigation that has been historically a problem in relationships between indigenous communities and those that police them. It would be a long haul to trial, which did not begin until January 2006. Picton pleaded not guilty to 27 charges of first-degree murder. For years, which is a form of mini-trial before a judge to determine what evidence would be put before the jury, took nearly a year. The judge would dismiss one of the counts and divide the remaining counts into two sets, one set of six murders that would be tried together and a second set of 20. The Crown would proceed with the smaller set first. When Picton was convicted of the first six counts of murder, the Crown decided to stay the remaining charges. That means that prosecution of those counts was suspended and, and could have been resumed within a year, or in some special circumstances at a date that's longer than a year. The first six counts were for Miss Frey, Miss Abbotsway, Miss Pappin, Miss Josbury, Miss Wolf, and Miss Wilson. The details are grim and will only be highlighted here. Forensic analysis found roughly 80 DNA profiles in the evidence, about half female half male. Picton had a loaded 22 revolver with a sex toy fixed to the barrel, fur-lined handcuffs, Spanish fly, syringes filled with blue liquid, night vision goggles, and ammunition. He would tell one friend that injecting heroin addicts with windshield washer fluid was an effective method of killing. 
and another that he strangled sex workers and then fed them to his pigs. The jury found him not guilty of first-degree murder, but guilty of six counts of second-degree murder. The difference in Canadian law being first-degree murder requires that the Crown prove an element of planning. Well, second-degree murder does not require that element, but instead they have to prove an intention to kill or an intention to injure in a way that death might be reasonably foreseeable. Both the Crown and defense appealed. The Crown appealed without any consultation with or prior notice to the families who were concerned that a Crown appeal could jeopardize the convictions and make them go through it all over again. The Crown would later apologize for that oversight. In the end, though, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the convictions for these six women. The Crown declined to proceed with the remaining 20 counts saying that Picton was already serving life without parole for 25 years, which is the longest sentence available at that time. And so there was no benefit to proceeding with the cost and the time and the complexity of another prosecution. Understandably, different families reacted differently to that decision. Some were relieved that they wouldn't have to relive the murders of their loved ones in court, well, others wanted to see Picton convicted with respect to their loved ones. And really, both positions are completely understandable. Some of the family members would sue the Vancouver Police Department, the RCMP, and the Crown for failures that left victims unprotected. That case was settled for $50,000 to each of the children of victims without any of the police or Crown having to admit wrongdoing. Vancouver police would undertake a management review of their handling of missing persons cases, which led to Picton getting away for a long time. It was 1995 when the first of his victims that we know of went missing. Two years later, he attacked Ms. Isiter. Women continued to disappear while he was on release for that charge. They would acknowledge failures in their investigation and would apologize to the families for not having caught Picton sooner. Their lack of investigation, general treatment of sex workers and addicted people, and lack of a willingness to apply resources also led to the Picton investigation Coming part of the focus of the federal inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that began in 2016. There were a number of gaps in the Picton case. It was kind of a perfect storm of failures colliding that allowed Picton to get away for so long, to take so many lives, a lot of failure. Not only did police historically underrepresent and act with indifference toward indigenous women and girls, sex workers, and drug addicts, but they had an opportunity to gather further evidence with the 1997 attempted murder case and a 1999 case of Lynn Ellingson, who apparently had seen a woman's body at Picton's farm, and information received for a second time from Bill Hiscox who was a Picton farm worker, that a female friend of his had seen women's clothing, purses, and IDs at the farm. It was not until a former truck driver reported illegal guns that the farm was searched for the first time. Gaps also existed because of poor attitudes towards sex workers and drug addicts by police and the resulting mistrust of police by women who were vulnerable. Hayes interviewed 183 sex trade workers between 1999 and 2001 that highlighted the problem of a developed and profound distrust of authorities. More than 60 of the testimonies of affected individuals during the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry dealt directly with the Picton investigation and how Indigenous women were treated and affected. These testimonies also highlight a profound distrust of authorities that arose from both disinterest and direct ill-treatment by police. 
Today, as a result of reviews related to the Picton case, the Vancouver Police Department has a dedicated missing person unit, and investigations are begun without delay. Family members are advised and consulted before the police release information, and all case files are kept open until a missing person is located. In December 2023, the RCMP planned to dispose of the evidence they hold in the case. Nearly three dozen groups from across the country oppose that plan. They are concerned that destroying the evidence will jeopardize solving a number of open and still unsolved cases. Given that the forensic analysts found near 80 separate DNA profiles, that concern is more than legitimate. And just to make the point that some lessons remain unlearned, the RCMP did not inform the families about their plans to dispose of the evidence. Instead, they filed applications with the court beginning in 2020 for authority to dispose of materials. Remember, much of the evidence involves unsolved cases and unprosecuted cases. Officially, only six of these cases are solved. 27 were initially charged. 34 female DNA profiles were found. Confession to 49 killings and up to 50 missing women cases. There is credible evidence that Picton may have had accomplices, one or more, in some of the cases, and no one else has been charged or convicted but Picton. Scientific advances regularly lead to resolving cold cases. It seems nearly daily that's happening. As a retired investigator points out, quote, what might not seem relevant right now is only one new witness or one new piece of evidence away from potentially being very relevant to solving current cold cases, end quote. We would hope that when this is back before the court this month, that the evidence in this case is maintained in a way that ensures that any evidence needed for future justice to solve cold cases and to finally find answers remains available, not only for the direct families in this case, because that is essential, but so the public can have faith that any future questions can be answered properly and fully. Thank you for listening, and as we leave this case, we will focus on the aspects of this case that matter most, that have always mattered most. The victims. They were Serena Abbotsway, 29, missing August 22, 2001. Mona Lee Wilson, 26, missing November 30, 2001. Andrea Josbury, 22, missing June 8, 2001. Brenda Ann Wolf, 32, missing April 25, 2000. Georgina Faith Papin, 34, missing March 2001. Marnie Leanne Frey, 24, missing December 29, 1997. Jacqueline Michelle McDonald, 22, missing January 16, 1999. Diane Rosemary Rock, 34, missing December 13, 2001. Heather Kathleen Bottomley, 27, missing April 17, 2001. Jennifer Lynn Firminger, 28, missing December 27, 1999. Helen May Hallmark, 20, missing June 15, 1997. Patricia Rose Johnson, 25, missing January 2, 2001. Heather Gabriel Chinook, 30, missing April, 2001. Tanya Holick, 23, missing November 3, 1996. Sherry Lee Irving, 24, missing February 22, 1997. Inga Monique Hall, 46, last seen February 1998. Tiffany Louise Drew, 27, Missing December 31st, 1999. Sarah Jean DeVries, 
29, last seen April 1998. Cynthia Cindy Felix, 43, last seen December 1997. Angela Rebecca Jardine, 27, missing November 20th, 1998. Mission Jane Doe, unknown age, discovered February 25th, 1995. Deborah Lynn Jones, 42, last seen December 2000. Wendy Crawford, 43, last seen December 1999. Terry Lynn Koski, 38, missing January 7, 1998. Andrea Faye Borhaven, 25, last seen March 1997. Kara Louise Ellis, 25, missing January 21, 1997. Marianne Clark, 25, disappeared August 1991. Yvonne Marie Bowen, missing. March 16, 2001. Dawn Teresa Cray, last seen December 2000. If you're enjoying these videos and want more, don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you don't miss any videos. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it.